What an honor it is that I get to come here and share today. Um, it's just amazing the things that have been done in my life. And at times I wish I could be like Sierra and let somebody else stand up here and tell my, tell my story because I feel others, you know, can portray it better than I can myself. Um, to, I want to start by, to tell you where I am today, I kind of have to go back to where I was in my childhood. Um, so that's kind of where I'm going to start. Um, I grew up as what most people would call n normal in our area. I mean, I was active in sports. Um, we did the whole church thing on like holidays, you know, we went on Christmas and Easter and stuff like that. I mean, my parents portrayed it as more important to our kids than it was for us to go as a family. Um, I grew up in the Catholic church. I, um, did the whole communion and catechism and all that. I was an altar boy for sev several years or whatever. So, I mean, as I was little, I grew up knowing God. I just didn't know him personally. I knew there was a God. I knew everything that God could do. I just never had a relationship with him. Um, growing up, my family was also very worldly, and for the most part, most of them still are. Um, growing up, I would say I was pretty much destined to follow in all of their their steps. Um, when I was very young, my parents split up. I was too young to know most of it. Um, I did most of my growing up with my dad. Um, I had an older brother and an older sister. Um, he did the best he could raising me. I would never say anything bad for my dad, and he was a great father. The only problem was there was no spiritual guidance from him. I didn't learn anything on that aspect. I learned what was important in the world. Um, like I said, my dad kept us very active. He was always at basically every event we ever had, every sporting thing, anything in our school. I mean, he was that active parent that never missed any of it. That was until the weekends would roll, roll around. Friday and Saturday would get here, and that was his unwind time. Um, it was, you know, basically get off work at 4 o'clock and until Sunday after the football games, that was about when the drinking time ended, as from what I can remember. I mean, even being little, I can remember in the town we lived in, all of the families brought their kids to the bars with them. I mean, it was a completely acceptable thing, you know. They would give us a roll of quarters and tell us, go play those video games until until we're done drinking and ready to go home, you know, and then, of course, we'd all pile into a car and somebody drunk would drive home, you know. What, what's the big deal, you know. That's just, that's how it was looked at and that's how it was thought of. It's just the small town that we grew up in. Um, looking back, I would say it's that part of my childhood that probably opened the door for most of the choices I decided to make in my life. Um... I mean, in that bar scene, I clearly, you know, can remember, it seemed like the cool thing to do, you know, when you grow up, you're going to drink, you're going to smoke, you're going to party, you're going to have a good time, so I kind of decided as when I was, I don't know, maybe around like fifth, sixth grade, that's what I wanted to do, I wanted to be the life, I wanted to have the fun, you know, so it was around that time where we would have like family picnics and Fourth of July parties or barrel parties, you know, for the adults and Around that age, I started, you know, they'd ask, go get kids, go get their drinks, and we'd start sneaking sips or putting cups aside for ourselves, you know, or, you know, grabbing a pack of cigarettes from somebody along that lines or whatever and kind of just sneaking away. Um, never really thought much about any of it. It was just, like I said, is what was acceptable for us. Um, as I mentioned, I have an older brother. He also... Um, is very worldly. I mean, he's been in and out of jail. He still is a, what I would consider a raging alcoholic. Um, he's got many, many health issues, but I, I really want to try and not go there. Um, by the time I hit eighth grade, um, I figured out that all I really wanted to do was what I wasn't supposed to be doing. That Those were the things that were fun to me. By the time, you know, eighth grade, freshman year, it had become acceptable for most of us, I mean, to once in a while have a drink or have a cigarette. So, I mean, the game had to be upped. Um, I've 
always been such an addict that it's always been about pushing limits with me. I mean, there's never just a fine ground where I was just happy with what I was doing. It always had to go to the next level. So around 7th, 8th grade, uh, a couple of my friends who I liked to party with had introduced me to marijuana, which, again, where we lived was no big deal. I mean, anyone over... Any, most people that smoked cigarettes where I lived smoked weed, too. It was a completely acceptable thing, and it still is very much in, in, in our town or whatever. But So I started regularly smoking marijuana by the time I would say I was in about eighth grade. Um, these things went very unnoticed. Like I said, as long as you kept up your act of you know getting your grades in school, attending class, on the weekends, everyone disappeared, and us kids could go do whatever we wanted, you know? Um, I would say it was about the time I was entering high school is where that, that summer is where I would say the spiral truly happened in my life. Um, it might have just been minor things, but by that point, there was no more just doing things for fun. It was drinking to get drunk. It was smoking to be high. It was never wanting to be sober is what it, what it was. It was you grow accustomed to that feeling of, of the high. Um, so going into high school, I didn't really have a game plan for anything. I mean, all I really knew that I wanted in high school was that I wanted to have a lot of friends. I wanted to be the life of the party. I didn't want to be an outsider. I didn't want to be alone. Um, th that's all that was important to me. And it didn't take me long to realize in high school that the easiest way to do that was to party. Everybody wants to party. I mean, you name it. You got your jocks, your stoners, your hippies, all of them. That's the common ground all of them shares. Every single one of them want to party one way or another. Um, I had a advantage, I guess you could call it, going into high school. My sister was a senior as I was becoming a freshman, which got me, well, you, I would say, like access to a lot of bigger parties as I was younger and probably shouldn't have been at. Um, it was at most parties like this where I could see things got a little worse. Like I said, most of them were were already older and had been in that atmosphere for you know, four years or however long, and they were moving on to bigger and better things. And it was at a party, you know, I don't even know where anymore, but I do know that it was at a party where I was offered um, cocaine for my first time. And I'll tell you, the first time, I have no remembrance of it, honestly. The first time I did cocaine, I can't tell you. The, the, it's just, there's too many of my nights that are gone. I just don't remember them. It's just flashbacks, and I know the stories of, you know, what I did and what had happened. But um, that was a complete different grip. That drug grabbed a hold of me, and it did not want to let go. I mean, I can clearly, clearly remember even just talking about it, which is why I have such a hard time to talk about these things, is the feelings and the high that it would give me on when I was on them. The problem with uh, being a cocaine addict is the amount of money that it costs to do a drug like that. It's not at, you know, 17 years old, 16 years old, uh, going and asking your parents for $20 is not going to cut it. You know, so you resort to, you start stealing, you start robbing, you start doing anything you can think of to get money. And I won upped it, and I, I played it, played right into my parents' hands, and I was like, you know, I'm... 16 years old, I'm going to get a job. That's what you want me to do, right? That's the perfect perfect thing. You don't have to give me gas money. You don't have to do anything. Uh, and I, f I found a sweet deal for a job. I really did. I found a full-service gas station, which was more or less a drive through drugstore. I mean, you could <laughs> do anything you wanted there, and everyone there was a user. I, I can honestly say there was not one employee there that was not partying the whole time we were there. Um, it was it was there one late night when we had decided we were going to start partying a little bit early before before we had gotten off work, and uh, one of the employees looked at me and he says, "Hey, are you ready to go do a line?" And I'm like, "Of course, why not?" You know. 
So I go in, and as soon as I, I bent down and did that line, I came back up, and I looked at him, and I said, that wasn't Coke. What did you just give me? Or whatever. You know, and he looked at me and just kind of smirking and laughing, and he's like, well, this is a new drug for you to try. It's heroin. I'm like, well, I mean, by this point, though, I was such a drug addict. You know, I mean, I had dabbled in basically everything except heroin. It didn't really phase me all that much. I mean, looking back now, it was kind of a cruel, cruel thing that was done. But, I mean, at the time, I'm just like, okay, well, I'm going to roll with this, you know. So, I mean, that, the addiction from heroin was more intense than anything I could ever explain. I can't even put it into words. I mean, nothing of life is of importance anymore once you are addicted to it. All you can think about when you wake up is where am I going to get my first score? Where am I going to get my hit? I mean, that, it consumes every single minute, day of your life. Um, so from here, I, it was an, it was an Im immediate addiction. Um, like I said, I, it became a daily, a daily thing from my first, first use. I mean, first use, I liked it that much that I never went another day not using it. It was such an inexpensive drug. I mean, I went from spending hundreds of dollars a day on cocaine to spending, you know, $50 a day on heroin for a way bigger high but this is where where my life spirals worse and worse by the time I realized how bad my drug use had gotten and I gotten into it it was way too late to get out of it I was taking regular runs up to the city picking up massive amounts of drugs you know bringing them all home um, I had a couple encounters with cops um, the problem with doing that many drugs is eventually you become immune to them you can no longer get high. It takes more and more and more every time you want to do it and the amounts that you need um, to where it just becomes ridiculous. Um, I knew what the next step was to where I could still get my high, and it was the one thing that I felt separate, felt that it separated me from all the, the rest of my friends that were drug addicts. It was the one thing that I felt kept me from calling myself a junkie, and that was shooting up. I knew as soon as I did that, there was no turning back. I, I mean, looking at it now, it's, it's nonsense. I mean, I was doing the drug either way. I mean, to me, there's no difference between putting it up your nose or putting it in your vein. Um, but, I mean, in my mind of rationalizing at that time, that was the one thing I told myself, I will never go there. No matter what happens, I'm not going to cross that line. Um, it didn't take long for that line to be crossed. Like I said, all inhibitions leave when you're doing drugs like that. Um, soon, I was regularly shooting up several times daily, and that drug use quickly, quickly caught up to me. It led to my first overdose, which, I, I, to be honest with you, I can't even tell you how many overdoses I've had. Woke up in the hospital too many times to where they say you're lucky to be alive. You'd think things like that would change you, but that's really just what I, I'm trying to stress is is just how bad that stuff grips onto you. Um, so I woke up in the hospital, and it was one of them. I'm sure, you know, people have seen that show, Intervention, where, you know, we're, we're offering you a line of hope or whatever. We're offering you this great gift or whatever. Basically, it was forced rehab is what it was. I was told you're going to go to rehab or you're going to be completely cut off. You're not going to have nothing around here, nowhere to live, blah, blah, blah. So I did that. Um, I went into rehab. I, I would say I was there probably a couple months every day just waiting. You know, when can I get out of here? When can I go back to the lifestyle I like? When can I, you know, that <laughs> that's what was getting me through my days. So I played the system in there while I was in there very well. Um, I was able to get access outside and inside, and it was outpatient therapy along with inpatients. So the outpatients brought in the drugs, the inpatients did them, you know. They got all these rich kids in there that want to do what they want. So it didn't take long to get kicked out of rehab. Um, we brought in a fifth of vodka. We drank it one night and breathalyzers in the morning, and about eight of us were gone. So, um, but anyway, um, so I come back home, and... 
I did a little bit of, you know, living in my car, returning to my lifestyle, basically anything I could to get by. Um, it's actually, when I came back and started using, is where a small turn started towards God in my life. I came back, and the joy and the rush of doing those drugs was gone. It's like I had this pit inside of me. And no matter what I did, no matter how much, I could not feel it. Fill it. I just, it just seemed to be there no matter what. And it was just like a thirst that could not be quenched. So I decided I'm going to still live that lifestyle, but I'm going to try and reconnect with some of my relationships, which is where I came back across um, my wife. And when we first met, we, we partied together. I mean, that, that's how we met, actually. Um, but I had disappeared for, I don't know, a year, two years, somewhere in there. And when I went back to find her, she was very different. She did not want to do the things that I wanted to do anymore. She wanted to sit there and tell me about a different way to live, about this God, which, like I said, I grew up as a little kid. Yeah, I know God. He don't do nothing, whatever. Um, but I would sit in her room, and I would try and detox, and I would cry every single night, and I would I would go right along with it. I would be like, God, take this then. If you're this all-powerful God, go ahead. Do what you got to do. I don't want to do these drugs anymore. I'm tired of being an addict. I don't want it. It's needed, though. And this went on for quite a while, actually, um, I had multiple opportunities to get clean. Um, I mean, I, I think I locked myself in a room for a while just to let the drugs pass through my system. And as soon as they would and I would get outside, I would just return to what I always knew. Um, I followed her to church a couple Sundays. Even that, I mean, that's first glance Burl and Deborah got of me. It was me following her there. Not in condition to be sitting in a church, that's sure. It was just the most awkward thing ever. I mean, to walk into a church just zonked, you know? So I, I can imagine the first impressions they had of me and of what they had heard from her over the years, you know? Um, but it, I knew so little that God did have a huge, huge plan. And after a long, long time of me groaning and complaining to God, he finally said, okay enough's enough then if if you want this to stop i'm gonna make it stop then you cry to me on a daily basis let's let's do it then you know and it put me back in the hospital <laughs> it led to another overdose this one was very very different though um i was out of it for i really don't know i've only seen pictures i mean there was feeding tubes life support i know i was revived Complete kidney failure, my liver was shutting down, infection, you know, all, all that stuff, basically. But I do remember waking up, and I can imagine my family was there, probably somebody, the whole time I was in that hospital. But I remember one person coming to visit me in the hospital, and that was none other than Burl. I remember him walking in and giving me a Bible. And in the Bible, it just had a little inscription, um... And it just said, you know, Jeff, you've been given a second chance. It's time you use this second chance. And, and he looked at me and, you know, and he said, God has a plan for your life. And it's a great plan. And I took it and I was ready to change. I was, I was done. I didn't, I couldn't go on anymore. I mean, I was, it was just becoming too, too difficult. But I remember those nights in the hospital I remember sitting with no one around, you know, those two, three, four in the mornings when the hospital was just quiet. And I remember being in my room and finally picking up the Bible. I remember reading stuff, and it, it started to come alive to me. You know, stories of people failing and people succeeding through way worse things of anything I had been through. And I just, I just, it all just started jumping off the page at me, which really, really opened my eyes. What God did tell me, though, once I started connecting with him, was that everything you've done is still going to have a consequence. Just because you know me now and I'm with you, don't, don't expect your life to be this peachy, 
easy, great thing. Not everything's going to go your way. All those choices you made, there's still lingering consequences for those. It was shortly after this um, that I was told by the doctor that the infection had spread through my through my body and it was entering up higher into my body and they said they were going to have to cut a leg off. Um, you know, you'd think for most that that news would really crush you. It wasn't that that time. I think I was so new to knowing God at that point that I had a peace with it. It really did not bother me, you know. So I, I went on, and, and, I, and I was okay for it all. Um, it wasn't until a couple more months had gone by. And I was, I was starting therapy by this time. I'd lost one leg, you know, and we were trying to get the other one to function. And then I got the news that that one was going to have to be cut off. And this is where my biggest doubt in God started anywhere. I, I started asking the question, why? What, what is the point of that? You know, you're this all-powerful God. You can heal this, you know. What, what is your reasoning for this? I don't understand it. You know, when you get those thoughts of suicide, you know, who's ever going to want me? Look, look at me, I'm this handicap. I got no legs. You know, what use am I going to be for you? You know? What I realized is that it was right there, there was a real battle going on for my soul. I never paid attention to it, really. I was put at a crossroad. And I could choose to live the life I've always known, the lies, the comfort, and not have to deal with anything. Or I could take the less ro less traveled road. I could walk with God and be uncomfortable every step of the way. It's in these times, though, where when you're broke down and you got nothing, nothing to hold on to, is where you can feel close to God. I would reach out to Him, and it's the most alive He ever feels is when I'm broken down and I've got nothing holding me back. Nowhere to turn, not anything. But I really feel like anything I have, my story is just beginning. I, when, when I came to know Christ, all of that was gone. It was, it was why I never wanted to get up and talk about it. Once I learned of Christ and he saved me, I was like, that part of me is dead. Why does anyone even care or need to know it? And it's just now where I'm realizing, like, he wants to use that, you know? And it's it's hard for me to talk about it. It really is. Um, just a multitude of things of me not understanding it all yet and those feelings and those memories rushing back to me. I mean, they're very, very consuming But God has done a lot of things in my life since I've come to him. I mean, the miracles are never, ever ending. One of the most frequent questions I get since losing my, since losing my legs is, you know, how many, how many pain meds do you got to be on now, you know? What do you do for all them phantom pains and all that? And one day a guy woke me up and said, I don't want you taking any of that. You, you want to trust in me? You want to lean on me? He's like, do it. Quit with the stuff you're doing. It's going to lead you back down the same road you were on. So I decided to just stop one day, and I've never returned to it, you know. I, I, that's, just, that's just the beginning of things, though. Um, he gave me the thing my heart was desiring and what I was chasing for for years. Besides him, it was my wife. I would have done anything for her. I mean, she was my desire. She was what I wanted, and, and the chase was the thrill of it all. And he slowly brought her back into my life. And then on top of that, he took me back to those questions of me asking him, you know, who will need you? What are you going to want me to do? You know, those questions that I spoke to God when I was wanting to kill myself. And he showed me a picture of my boys. And it's, it's seeing them where I know they need their father. They need me to be with them. God has also brought my mom alongside with me. I burned that bridge with her so many times in my drug use. 
and through this all she's come to know the Lord. If, if that's all that was done through my thing, it was worth it. So really, I mean, God has been pouring blessings out on me year after year, blessing after blessing, and I really can't go through all of them, but he's constantly doing a work inside of me. Each and every day, he seems to dig up something new that needs to be dealt with, something that I need to work on, and to be frank, it's stuff that always just freaks me out. I don't ever want to do it. I mean, even this right here, this is what... This is where he's had me for quite a while now. He's like, you need to go talk somewhere. I'm going to show you where, you know. And then, bro, out of nowhere, he's like, hey, I want you to come speak. And I'm like, no, great. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this stuff freaks me out. I mean, I just, I struggle with it. I do know, though, that no matter where God leads me, I mean, I'm so glad that I've been able to learn and study his word. I mean, I know he's not going to leave me. He'll never forsake me. And I know that he will be with me. I know, you know, it's it's my job to pick up my cross and walk with him, you know. Nobody's going to do it for me. So, where I believe I am right now and where God is taking me is I think it's going to be full circle. I believe this is just a small taste, a test to see if I would be obedient. I believe he's going to send me back to all those people, you know, that I used to party with or into those bars where I hung out or anywhere and he needs light shined on them. They need to know that there's another another way to live. Um, I mean, people will always offer something, but they need to be offered God is what they need. I've tried all the other things and none of them worked for me. I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but God was the only way out. I mean, you're not ever going to find anything that can fill, fill that hole inside of you except for God. So, I guess what I really want to say is that no matter what kind of problems anybody's going through, we need to make sure we don't put God in this little box and, and think that it's not something that he can handle. I mean, I truly, in my heart, believe that if I woke up tomorrow and God said, okay, I want you to have your legs back, you could grow them back in a, in a flash. You know, I mean, I don't think that is going to happen because that's not the plan, but I, I don't think there's anything that God cannot do. And I think... We let our problems run our lives instead of letting God run our lives. You know, we follow our problems and we make them out to be these big, huge things. And when you look at the grand scheme of it all, they're just these tiny problems. So all I really wanted to say, you know, is just let God take care of all of it. You know, be obedient to him. And he'll be with you each and every step of the way. And I hope that, you know, when I die... I can stand before God and he's going to say, you know, job, job well done. <laughs>